Okay, welcome to the IAE Awards 2020 online program. We're so pleased to welcome you today to this latest event in our series of online webinars designed to really inspire and influence you and your business to share environmental best practice with some of the very in interesting things that are happening in particular around sustainable transport. Today's event will be focused on from encouragement to advocacy, what workplaces can do to get people traveling more sustainably. Throughout the webinar, you can ask questions by the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and then they will then be answered later in the event. Recordings of, of all events throughout the week will be shared by e-newsletter to all attendees on Friday. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the IIE Awards, and we decided to launch a full program of free online events for you and your team to join. The aim is to engage organizations with different environmental initiatives to inspire, influence, and again, share that best practice that's happening out there. The program will culminate in the IIE Awards at four o'clock on International Clean Air Day, which is this Thursday, the 8th of October. This year has been a very unsettling and difficult year for many, uh, for businesses, for communities and individuals. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has made, you know, the health and, and sustainability of our, our environment has never been uh, so critical and uh, so well kind of understood. The climate crisis and loss of biodiversity has been further exacerbated by the economic health and social challenges posed by this pandemic. And it's markedly changed business practices for the long term. And we hope that there are some really positive opportunities that, that do arise from this really difficult situation. We believe changing working practices to incorporate environmental decisions into the very heart of our organizations is vital to build resilience and create strong, sustainable businesses. So by running our events online this year, we were hoping to bring people together, share learnings, and be an example of how events can be run sustainably in the future too. If you'd like to attend any other events this week, there's still time to register your place at the IIE website. Today, we'll be hearing from Matthew Barber, Head of Partnerships, Midlands and East at Sustrans. Sustrans is a charity that works to ensure the benefits of walking and cycling are enjoyed by everyone, and they aim to create healthier places and happier people. Matt's talk from encouragement to advocacy, what workplaces can do to get people traveling sustainably, aims to give you a range of practical ideas backed up with case studies from across the UK of how to get more employees traveling sustainably to, from, and even for work. He'll also talk about taking it a step further and encouraging your business to look to back sustainable local tra transport policy and advocacy. We'll also be announcing the winner of IE's special award category, Sustainable Transport Champion, towards the end of the event. Thank you to Cross Keys Homes for supporting this category as a sponsor and for making this event possible today. This Thursday, as I mentioned, is also International Clean Air Day and with transport having such a big impact on air quality, we're very pleased to bring you this webinar today. So without further ado, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Perfect, brilliant. Thanks ever so much, April. And yeah, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's absolutely great to be here. Um, yeah, and as April said, yeah, Matt Barber, um, Head of Partnerships for the Midlands and East region for Sustrans. Um, and for those of you that don't know Sustrans, we're a national charity and quite simply, we make it easier for people to walk and cycle. So I'm just gonna move my slides on. Here we go. And there's a nice picture from Cambridge. Um, so yeah, today I'm hopefully going to talk through some ideas, some thoughts, and yeah, ultimately, hopefully a bit of positivity around getting more of your employees traveling sustainably to work. So before I begin a slight caveat, I'm going to predominantly talk about walking and cycling today and actually mainly on cycling. Now that's, that's not to say that public transport, car sharing and walking aren't important, um, that they, they're all critically important and they've got a huge role to play in changing people's behaviour. Um, and although public transport, you might argue, is a little bit up in the air at present because of the pandemic with social distancing and restriction in numbers, um, at Sustrans we do truly believe in the importance of enabling multimodal journeys 
um, you know, for example, cycling to the station, then catching a train and then walking or cycling at the other end. Um, and below uh, on that slide, there's just a, just a couple of images to get you thinking about the importance of what's beyond the boundary of your workplace and how the wider infrastructure influences uh, and impacts on the people, uh, your employees and how they travel to and from work. Okay, now these images um, are, are cropped straight out of uh, the gear change document, uh, which has very recently been announced by government, and I will talk about it in a little bit more detail later. Um, and you know, I don't particularly want to dwell on this because I, I think and I hope the majority of you already understand the benefits of getting more of your employees traveling actively to and from work, but I do think it provides some useful context. And to me, actually, it just again re-emphasizes the scale of just how good it is to be getting people walking, cycling. You know, it's good for your business, it's good for your employees, and it's good for the wider society. And I think it's important at this stage to say that, yeah, whilst I believe really passionately uh, about getting more and more people walking, cycling, and I think there's a huge amount of potential, I'm also a realist, I'm a pragmatist. And so whilst, you know, on a number of levels, I do think that motor vehicles dominate our society far too much, there is an acknowledgement that we'll never change everyone's behaviour. And, you know, if for your workplaces, there'll undoubtedly be people who live, you know, 10, 15 miles away in a village with no public transport. You know, the chances of them changing their behaviour are very, very slim. So what can you do in your respective workplaces? Um, and I'm sure a number of you have already thought about this, probably already do a lot of it. Um, but I'm just going to take you through a number of slides to start thinking about some of the basics. And then we're going to move on to sort of a more policy and advocacy element, which I think is something that's quite interesting to explore. But the first sort of questions that I'd be asking are, do you, do you understand your staff? Do you know where they live? or how many of them live within five miles of your workplace? Have you spoken to those that drive? Um, those that drive that live nearby, you know, are you having conversations with them? What are their barriers? Um, you know, really, you know, we're all busy people, so you need to focus your, your energy. Um, and I, I, I always use that, that, that bar graph in the, in the bottom corner. Um, you know, 68% of all trips in England are less than five miles, and of them, 56% are driven. So that's really important because as a nation, we make a number of very short trips in our cars and they are the trips that we want to be, we want to be concentrating on. Okay, so once you've got that intelligence, you know, you've got a good understanding of how your employees travel to and from work, I, I, I'd recommend just having a good hard look at yourselves. You know, does your workplace actually say, we want you to walk and cycle? You know, sadly, I've been to far too many workplaces where, you know, the cycle parking's uncovered, you know, it's hidden behind the bin store, the change of facilities double up as a storage room, you know, which is never clean, there's nowhere to dry your clothes or store your bags. So I think, you know, if we're being honest to ourselves about wanting to change behaviour, we need to ask ourselves these questions, we need to be critical of ourselves. Um, and, and actually ask ourselves, do we value the staff that, that walk and cycle? Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I've seen it done really, really well. Uh, you know, I've seen workplaces remove half a dozen car parking spaces directly outside their front entrance and turn it into a cycle parking compound. You know, I've seen workplaces that provide clean, warm towels every day. Um, you know, there is there is a lot of good practice out there um, that that can make a real big difference. But the next point I want to make is actually, it's, I think it's quite easy for workplaces. As I said, you're very busy with lots of competing pressures to, to look at your, your workplace, but not necessarily go beyond the boundary. And I, and I think actually this is, this is crucial. You, you need to look at your nearby routes. You need to look at how your workplace is, your work, how, you, how your workplace accesses this, how your staff access it. Is it safe? Is it well maintained? Is it well signed? You know, this information is really important. When we're looking at changing people's travel behavior, we need to start thinking about door-to-door -door journeys. You know, you could have the best changing facilities in the country, but if you're next to a dual carriageway with no safe, you know, no safe routes, then, you know, everything that you do is going to be negligible and have, have a limited impact. So I'm going to come back to this point around the infrastructure that is 
around your workplace later because I think I think actually that is a, a critical point. Okay, so you've got a good understanding of where your staff live, you understand why some of them drive, you've looked at their barriers, uh, you know your facilities, you know the nearby routes. The next question I'd be asking is, is genuinely, again, does your workplace care about how your staff travel? Um, does your travel plan, does it have clout? You know, who, who owns it? Who is the senior responsible owner? It, do, the, are directors aware of it? Do di directors even discuss it? Um, you know, I've seen and worked with some absolutely tremendous people in workplaces that sort of, you know, who are facilities managers or responsible for corporate social responsibility. Um, you know, they, 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 they try their best, but they don't quite have the seniority um, to, to change things. Um, I, I, well, there's always one example that comes to mind where a wonderful person wanted to make a big difference, but the, the chief executive, when they did turn up, landed in a, in a helicopter and, and the senior management all had car parking spaces right out the front and they were all big fancy cars. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you need buy-in from the top to change the travel culture of your employees. And, and, you know, where I've seen it work well, it is when you've had senior management who have walked, they've cycled, they've car shared, they've even scooted, you know, they've, they've sort of said, you know, I can see the benefits of it myself and I want this to be replicated um, amongst my, my employees. Okay, so this is my last slide on, on sort of the in encouragement angle. Um, and I think I want to say that there's, there's a huge amount you can do in sort of support, supporting, rewarding, incentivizing your employees, you know, from those fresh warm towels um, to offering, you know, cycle repairs, cycle training, free breakfasts, establishing a network of champions. Uh, I, I really like that. And Sustrans really like this, the network of travel champions. We've, we've seen it done well in a, a number of locations. And it's not just about saying that's the person who cycles, that's the person who catches the bus. It's about giving them some time and space within their actual job to become a travel champion so that they've got the time to engage with colleagues, to support them, to, to help plan a, a walking route, a cycling route, to, to tell them where the bus stop is and how much the bus will be. Yeah, you know, that's, that's how to take things seriously. Um, and I would just say, you know, the emphasis needs to be on establishing a, a culture, a new culture, a culture of, of, tra of, of active travel, not necessarily just about one-off events. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, doing something in your workplace for walk to work week or cycle to work day, it's, it's really brilliant. It's great. Um, but actually we want that sort of behavior to become embedded and it to become routine and it to become normal. And we know that's difficult, um, but you know, all those times when you run a, a free cycle breakfast, do you, you know, is that actually something you could be doing? You could be doing every day. Okay, so I'm now gonna slightly change tact on the presentation because up to this point, I've given you sort of an overview some ideas and some possible steps to take and whilst I do really believe that they are very important they should become commonplace in all of our workplaces I do want to acknowledge that actually we've been doing this sort of encouragement this sort of travel planning for decades now and, and nationally it's made very little difference certainly in terms of cycling levels about the way we travel I'd like to now discuss why this might be and what you can do to, to help and to hopefully change this trend. So the first thing, and it's a good thing, is we, we know why people don't cycle. You know, it's not because they need to go and do their shopping on the way from home, or they've got too many bags, or they need to go and collect the children. It's because they don't have the confidence. It's because they don't feel safe to cycle. However, we do know that people want to cycle more. And that's really important. That's something really positive that we can all hold on to. And we saw that during lockdown, you know, in some areas, cycling levels bounced by 300, 400%. And that was because of quieter, calmer roads. So this infographic on the screen is from our Bike Life study. Now our Bike Life study is the largest assessment in the UK of the general public's perception towards cycling. 
and that general public point is really important. This isn't a survey by cyclists. This is a survey about from everyone. This covers the people who cycle every day to the people who don't cycle at all. And I just think there's some really big percentages in there that are really important to consider. You know, 28% of respondents don't cycle at all, but they want to. And 48% of respondents feel like they should cycle more. You know, this should be exciting for all of us. There is considerable potential out there to get your employees onto two wheels. But just to reiterate that safety point, you know, 79% of those respondents want traffic free routes to enable them to cycle more. You know, they want protected infrastructure. They want to be separated um, from motor vehicles. And that word enables really important. Um, because we've talked a lot about encouragement, but actually to truly change behavior, we need to enable it and we enable it through good quality infrastructure. So I'm on to my last few slides now, and, and I hope there's some food for thought there. Um, and I just want to give you some enthusiasm and some hope and some motivation, because firstly, active travel interventions are popular, full stop. You know, you can't argue that. You may have seen articles recently in the press, in the media, you know, sort of the bike clash type stories, trying to stir up and antagonize people about active travel, about cyclists, about car drivers. But the bottom line is that the vast majority of people want fewer vehicles on our roads. They want safer streets for our families and they want good quality infrastructure. They want good quality routes so that we can travel in a greener, healthier and happier way and your staff will be absolutely no different to that. Okay, so this is my penultimate slide um, and I briefly mentioned the gear change document earlier on in my presentation. Now this is a really considerable document released a matter of weeks ago by the Department for Transport. The forward was written by the Prime Minister himself, and it shows a really considerable commitment to getting people walking and cycling. It's certainly the largest commitment I've ever seen, um, and I've been working in active travel for over 15 years now. It, it's, it, it's a really accessible document. I'd, I'd encourage you all to take a look at it. But for me, there's, there's three sort of key points that come out of it and that, about what's required to make change, and it's around leadership, funding, and standards. And actually all of them, it feels like a heading in the di right direction. There's certainly leadership from central government now, the Department for Transport could not be clearer. Um, and we've seen that through the Emergency Active Travel Fund that they want us to reallocate road space. They want to challenge the status quo that exists on our roads. They want to get more people walking and cycling. Funding, the government, recently announced a two billion pound pot for walking and cycling. Um, a quarter of that has already been used up for the Emergency Active Travel Fund, but there's still a huge amount of funding that at present we don't know what it will be spent on or how local authorities will be able to access it. But that's certainly something that I'd be encouraging workplaces to think about. And then that last point that really starts to come through in, in the document, in the gear change document is around standards. So for many, many years, uh, organizations such as ourselves have been crying out for some high quality standards to show local authority partners, uh, to show highway authorities what good infrastructure looks like. What is the sort of infrastructure that needs to be on the ground that is going to get everyone cycling? When I say everyone at Sustrans, we talk about eight to 80. We want the infrastructure to be suitable for eight to 80 year olds. And so there is a document that's been recently uh, released. It's called Local Transport Note 120. Um, again, it's it's uh, a bit of bedtime reading for you, but it, it 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 does have some really good stuff in there about what our what our roads, what our communities, what our neighbourhoods could look like, um, and what's required to to get people out their cars and to get them walking and cycling. So I certainly feel we're in a really really exciting place at the minute. Um, and I'm going to leave you. This is my last my last slide, but I think there's some really, yeah, some really key questions here and a sort of a, a call to arms, if you will. Um, but the first question I'd be asking is, does do you know if your local authority has a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan um, called LC WIPs? LC WIPs are 
the thing at the minute when it comes to walking and cycling infrastructure. They have been mandated by the Department for Transport to, to create one of the local authorities. If they're going to be able to access future funding, they're going to need to have one of these plans. Um, we're working with a number of local authorities on them. Uh, my understanding is that the vast majority of highway authorities have one in some, some level of completion. Um, and I'd be encouraging you to find out and to have a read of it um, and to try and look where the prioritised routes are within it. So this plan will have a list of prioritised walking schemes and a list of prioritised cycling schemes. There, there are five, 10, 15 year document that's meant to set out a vision for that local area of how they're going to transform walking cycling levels. And so I'd, I'd definitely be saying, let, let's see it. Where are your prioritised routes? Is there a route that goes to your workplace? If not, why not? And how do you influence that? And how do you change it? I'm sure many of you have great relationships with your local authority partners. You know, a number of your your travel planning uh, teams will be will be speaking to local authorities fairly regularly, I should think. But you know, don't be afraid to reach out to the portfolio holder in the local authority responsible for transport or your member of parliament. You know, businesses have a huge voice, and it shouldn't be underestimated. Um, you'll see the, the graphic uh, of the logos in the bottom corner there and just a handful of the organisations that all came together in London uh, for the creation of the Supercycle Highways. Um, they came together, their chief execs and directors did a, a, a joint letter to the then mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and said, we want high quality, safe infrastructure so that our staff can walk and cycle to our offices. Um, and a, a, lot, a lot of people feel that it was that coming together of the business community that uh, that that was the that was the power that was the shift that was the change that was the the weight the clout the evidence to say we're going to go for this and and so I would again encourage you to to think beyond just your workplace if you're on a business park are there a number of workplaces that you could join up with. Um, and and maybe put in a, a joint letter to the local authority um but i would i as i said i've been doing this for 15 years and there are a number of hurdles but this is the most optimistic i've felt about active travel i think there's going to be a number of opportunities in the very near future for lots and lots of funding for really high quality infrastructure and you know, I don't want your your workplaces to miss out on it. So yeah, I suppose it's a, it's been a presentation of two halves. You know, about encouragement that it's really important. There's a lot of basics that your workplaces should be doing and should be getting right. Um, but encouragement alone probably won't have the impact that you want to see if the infrastructure, safe infrastructure, doesn't exist. Um, and so, yeah, don't be afraid to, to get involved in sort of advocacy and policy and planning. I'm sure many of you do it anyway. But um, yeah, reach out to uh, yeah, reach out to Sustrans, Cycling UK, um, local campaign groups. There's a lot of people out there who are willing to help. Um, but yeah, good luck. And yeah, if there's anything that Sustrans can do to help, please do get in touch. And yeah, hope to see lots more people walking and cycling in the in the very near future amazing um that's incredibly um insightful actually matt um you know the need to show uh, that businesses need to show uh, how they value their staff that want to cycle in was of particular interest as well as you know that checking of access points is the infrastructure right that leads to those workplaces and i know some of our businesses you know understand this well but you know, increasingly people just don't really know where to start with regard to, you know, how do they in a meaningful way push out a travel plan or a policy that, that has enough impact that engages, you know, more, more staff that are both willing and able to walk or cycle to work in particular. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of really good questions um, actually. So uh, I also wanted to comment as well you said that you know when it works well, when your travel plan works well, you see that senior managers show that they're on board too. So, uh, which is which is an excellent statement considering um, our our winner tonight or this afternoon. 
So one of the questions was, um, can you explain how the travel champions work? So you mentioned that you've worked with organizations that um, they have travel champions. What, what is that about? Is that within organizations themselves or across a network of different businesses? Could you explain that? Yeah, of, of course. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I mean, so Sustrans have done it um, in in a, in a few scenarios, they've they've done it on a on a on a on a business plan on a business part. But they've also done it with a number of large organisations. You know, we're talking multi multi hundreds on a on the same site, um, and it, 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 it's it's very simple. Normally, normally it involves a, a Sustrans project officer who would go in and work with that workplace, work with that travel plan officer. Um, with the you know the end goal is to create a network of travel champions and and so it's working it, it's working to recruit them and then it's 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 essentially supporting them through through training the provision of materials because that's 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 also part of it it's sort of to me it, it's a number of elements that all need to come together you know you could have like that you know the sort of stereotypical you know sort of I don't know bike bike person but as i said if they don't have you know access to 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 maps or even some maybe some funding to bring in um a, a bike mechanic or a number of bikes a pool bikes for people to share um it will it will only go so far and i think certainly where we've seen it work best is is where as i said in the presentation where people have got some space to actually do it themselves so they can go out and they can put out information on the intranet they can send out an email they can operate a notice board they can do things in the staff cafeteria area um but it, it's it's when it's it needs to, it can't just be sort of an add-on like i've seen organizations try and do it like you're our champion but you know their day-to-day -day job is incredibly busy and they haven't got the sort of the time and the space to to, to dedicate to it uh, don't get me wrong i think there's value in both but certainly where i've seen it work really well is it's where almost you know it's 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 almost written into their their job description Right. Yeah. Very good point. Um, people need to have a little bit of, of time built into their their job role to sort of tackle these things if they want to make a, an impact. Um, right. So, do you feel that car sharing will go back to being an important policy within businesses, in particular, you know, when people are traveling together to meetings, for example, post COVID, or should organizations be focusing more on you know, the active travel side of things, walking, cycling? Should they be buying e-bikes? What, what are your thoughts? Wow, I mean, it's I guess yeah, it's a really tough question at the minute. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, car sharing is completely out the window at the minute. Uh, we don't know how long social distancing is going to go on for. I, as an organisation, we've always taken a view that car sharing is part of the solution, but emphasis only on part of it. As an organisation, we're we can see few of it. It's the same same rings true for electric vehicles, like they're part of solving the climate crisis but actually we're more interested in how we get fewer vehicles and so i think i think for longer trips um like i said you know if you live 50 miles away um and there's no bus service or rail network then a car share solution could work really well um but you know going back to that point 68 percent of all trips are less than five miles uh i think if we can it often comes back to sort of biggest bang for your buck and for me it those changing those shorter trips are always going to be easier and and so it's uh, yeah and that's why for a lot of workplaces that we work with we sort of do that we do that five kilometer radius uh, the five mile radius from from the, 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 the from the workplace and then really go to town on what are the routes what are the access points what are the barriers um so yeah like i said i think car sharing it's going to be very interesting what what happens and you know the whole home working uh is is interesting and from what i hear from other organizations is that there's a lot of people who are who aren't planning to reopen their offices fully and it might be more of a blended return where people spend you know a couple of days in the office and then more time at home and again that might be an opportunity that people will allow to plan their diaries a bit better and it's it it breaks routine and we, when whenever we talk about behavior change we always look for key life lifestyle moments it's the best time to to change behavior whether it's having a baby moving house starting a new job it's when you're much likely to change your behavior and so coming out of a global pandemic almost certainly slots into place there and so if people are suddenly going to start saying well do you know what i'm only going to be working two days a week from the office now perhaps i can plan them to be 
a, a, you know, a Monday and a Friday, and I'm going to make a concerted effort to cycle on those days. I think there's a, I think there's a lot to be, there's a lot of fallout still to come, but actually now's the time for workplaces to start thinking about travel to and from their offices. And, and even more so with a high percentage of people working from home, there's a lot of people who aren't getting much physical activity. I don't know, I'm sure it's the same for most of you, but it's so easy for people to put back to back virtual meetings in your diary now that before you know it, you haven't had lunch and you haven't been outside the whole day. So actually how businesses can go some way to to almost ensuring that you're getting out and about and some physical activity because we all know the benefits of it would be a really great great thing to do yeah thank you that's, that's interesting it's one of the things that i've sort of personally committing to uh once we're sort of more back to normal is commuting at least once once a week by my bike and looking at e-bikes and things like that i love e-bikes e-bike people think e-bikes are cheating but e e for me is about enabling they should be enable bikes i i'm i'm really excited about e-bikes uh as we've seen on the continent i mean half of the german bike market is propped up by e-bike sales at the minute they're incredibly popular in the netherlands um i i think they're absolutely part of the solution i think they'll open up cycling to a to a bigger to a bigger audience um and of people who who, who might not have been have not even considered cycling in the past so yeah go go for an e-bike april <laughs> fantastic yeah Abs yeah you kind of sold me there which brings me kind of to the next question uh we've seen uh, a proliferation of the use of scooters in many cities um globally um what what do you think about e-scooters and is there a future there is this something that we should be looking at um pressing our local authorities to adopt you know what are, what are the considerations and pros and cons of, of scooters scooters really interesting uh yeah and is it i'd say that at the minute sort of uh public opinion is pretty split on it uh my my instinct is say that they have they they have a role to play in 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 sort of our our urban mobility solutions um they they they, they have the potential to remove cars from the network but I think there are some pretty legitimate concerns about their usage, especially on footpaths uh, and the, yeah, I guess how that can be, you know, I'm thinking about blind and partially sighted people. I'm thinking about families with children. Um, these scooters, I know they're limited. I think they're limited to 14 miles an hour, but actually that's, that's still pretty quick. They're silent. They come up on you very quickly. Um, uh, I, so I, I think there's a lot to consider about e-scooters uh, and interestingly there is some evidence coming out of Paris where they're being well used but they're not they're not replacing car trips so they're actually um, yeah they're replacing existing walking cycling and public transport trips so and, and that's ultimately that's what I'm most interested in is, is getting people out of their cars um, and of course, there's not a huge amount of uh, physical activity. Um, <laughs> well, there's none really, other than standing up. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm put it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm uncertain, a little bit on the fence about e-scooters. I'd like to think they're part of the mix, they're part of the solution. Um, but there's some sort of, yeah, as I said, legitimate concerns. There needs to be some legislation. Um, you know, I think there's still some confusion around the rental ones where you need a driving license, um, you know, around insurance. It's yeah, there's there's things to work out first. Um, yeah, there we go. How about okay. that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, uh, fair enough. So um, we have actually loads of questions. I'm just going to try and lump a few together. There's a, a few questions around, you know, showing uh, local authorities that there is enough demand for improving infrastructure. Um, but I guess, you know, someone's commented that, that sometimes there's a bit of a catch-22 situation with respect to cycling where people don't say they don't feel safe enough to ride on the road, but because there's not that investment in some places in safer cycling, then it seems like there's maybe not enough demand. How do we break that cycle, get more people riding? Should they be joining cycling clubs? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Again, a really valid, a really valid point. And that's a lot of what the work we tried to do i mentioned our, our bike life study the the uk's largest assessment of perception towards cycling because that that has surprised a lot of people that surprised a lot of 
decision makers you know a lot of my time is spent speaking to to counselors and to and, to, and for that point exactly to try and say there is a huge amount of of demand for people to cycle more um, and you need to you need to start ensuring that your your planning and your design work acknowledges that you know in, in bike life across all the bike life cities you know that ne nearly half of respondents said they feel like they should be cycling more and then it was 28 uh, percent say they don't they don't cycle at all at the minute but they they want to so actually i think there's an awful lot of evidence out there about people wanting to cycle more um, and there's a lot of evidence out there about why they don't cycle it's because they don't feel safe but it's how it's ensuring that lands and that lands with the right people and at Sustrans we as I said spend a huge amount of time trying to ensure that this message cuts through um, on every level um, but it doesn't always and it's sometimes hard to change people's opinions and people's views especially you know and this is this is what's so interesting at the minute because we're talking about change we're talking about challenging and the status quo that's existed for decades 50 plus years of everything has been built around mm -hmm. the car and designed around the car and and people don't necessarily like change but i do think there is a role for workplaces you know and that's why i said un firstly understand your staff you know do, do they want would they cycle if they had better infrastructure is that their main barrier and and if it is yeah, never underestimate the clout of local local business. I have heard of examples, not just in London, but I have heard of examples of people saying, well, we, we will not move um, to your local authority area. We are thinking of moving our new office, but we need we need a, we need a cycle path. We, we want you to build this. Um, yeah, take it, take it seriously. And also, I have seen travel plans produced. Um, which essentially don't go don't go far enough. And and if we want travel plans to have any any weight, they they should be saying they should be doing a full audit of 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 routes and of access and what needs to change because again that's something that's secured through the planning process that's something that we can be built on. Um, yeah, I, I, so I just yeah to summarise on that point, I think there's an awful lot of information out there uh, that that shows that people want to cycle more, but they need good quality infrastructure to do so. Amazing. Um, yeah, really interesting point about auditing routes and, and the process involved there. So just going to do two more brief ones, if, if I may, and then and move on here. Um, just for those, if we don't get to your questions, uh, we will try and answer everything uh, that we can on social media and uh, on our website um, after the events over the next couple of days. Um, so question, interesting question, actually. Does Sustrans or has Sustrans ever trialed some form of gamification, trying to maybe linking up with you know, apps like Strava uh, that might, you know, reward people for active transport? Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. So I think that's the two, two points. So, so for a long time, we ran uh, an online travel challenge. Um, actually, we still do run it. Um, but yeah, not, not as much as we as we used to. Um, and, and that was for uh, a lot of local authorities have run them for lots of workplaces. We sort of offered a bit more of a bespoke service to 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 sort of uh, large organisations, um, which had lots of support around it. And I think that's the key thing for us is sort of the gamification as as a role to play. It entices and engages a certain audience, but it's only part of it. And that's why a lot of our projects historically at Sustrans have been like, oh, you know, we'll do an active travel challenge. You know, we'll do some school engagement, something like that. But we're a lot more around trying to offer a bit more of a holistic package of support now. And then, it, you know, it'd be it, it would be wrong with me to sit here and say, yeah, you know, Sustrans, we deliver loads of workplace travel challenges and we get paid for doing it if those workplaces have got absolutely terrible infrastructure surrounding them. So we like to offer that that package of support where we might go in, we might train up some active travel champions, we might deliver a travel challenge, but also we will do a feasibility study for with our design with our design and engineering team who will look at some of the routes and actually start to plan you know what what is feasible what is practical and and maybe even sort of do a bit of a bit of hand holding and brokering with with the local authority with the highways authority um but again there are there are other people out there um uh, better points i think is probably the most well-known organization where you can log your active travel trips and you get points that get turned into rewards like a you know a free coffee at costa and that sort of thing we have 
had that in some of our projects where we've been brought in by a local authority partner to do one element and then better points have done another element um but you know yep strava uh, garmin connect you know i use them they they motivate me to an extent i think they motivate other people they're all part of they're part of the mix um but they're they're not sort of the the the, the miracle solution i'd say right okay fantastic so we didn't even get to talk anything about electric vehicles and, and that mix. So I think there's clearly scope for us to maybe revisit this topic in a, in a future webinar um, just due to the, the, the amount of interest in the question. So who should we be speaking to in our local authorities and what does this outreach look like? What is what is that path for a business? I think that's a really, really important question. And, and so I think it will vary dependent on the workplace. I I imagine most workplaces will have some contact with uh, the transport planning team or the, the environment planning policy team. And I, I would say engage, engage sort of a friendly officer in the local authority to start with to get the conversation going. Um, but as I said, don't don't be afraid to to go to sort of the key decision makers. Um, Certainly, I've seen success when people have have written a letter straight to the straight to their MP or straight to the portfolio holder. It, so every every local authority, whether it's a county council or a unitary authority, um, will will have a portfolio holder who's a councillor who will have overall responsibility for transport. Um, that person should be quite easy to find online. Their email should be quite accessible, um, and and I I. I would be strongly suggesting that you write an email to them if you've got concerns around how your employees get to it from your place of work um, and that you want them to be walking and cycling then then you should be directing that straight to them and, and essentially saying you know what what are you going to do about this um, and again building on you know if you've got some of that background knowledge that will only help you like I talked about LC whips they are the big thing at the minute they're not going to go anywhere DFT Every announcement the Department of Transport have said it's been like, if you've got a local cycling walking infrastructure plan in place, you will be in the best position to get future funding for infrastructure. Um, but of course, as these plans have a list of prioritised routes, it's based on data, it's based on evidence. But interestingly, it's based on census travel to work data. So again, that might play into the favour of a number of your workplaces. Um, but you need to be finding out what, what the routes are, what they're saying. Um, and ensuring that you know, if you if you think the route to our, our workplace is rubbish, then we want that to be in that plan, so that as future funding becomes available, that you're in a, in prime position to get an improved route. And just that last point is, I'm almost certain that the most significant type of funding with amount of funding we've seen for walking and cycling is 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 on the horizon. Put it that way. Brilliant. OK, so how, how can a business get SusTrans support? Or how can businesses even sus, uh, support you? So, so yeah, SusTrans is a charity, but we're a solutions-led organisation, so we deliver a lot of projects. Um, so, you know, we do work directly with workplaces who, who fund us. Um, and again, that could be on a number of different levels, from an officer level, um, actually coming in and doing engagement work, to um, yeah, more of that uh, sort of design and engineering stuff. We do get a number of workplaces who say, look, we really want to look at uh, improving access to this point. Can you look at that? Just just recently, we did a, a large project in Addenbrooke, so looking at, at access from all areas into into that massive site, just to give you an idea. So um, yeah, just reach out to us, talk to us, um, and yeah, we're 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 always you know we're not we're not. A, we're a large organization, but not a massive organization, but we, we, you know, we're all passionate about getting more people walking and cycling. So if there's anything we can do to help, we'll try our best. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. So uh, for all the others that have posted questions in the chat that we haven't gotten to, we will look at pulling together uh, sort of a Q and A document and, and getting those questions answered. Because I think uh, there's quite a few that are, are very interesting and we can, we can extend this conversation um, into the virtual sphere even further. Right, so now it is time to announce the winner of IIE's Sustainable Transport Champion, so a business that has really supported sustainable transport as an organization. 
Um, so this year, because we're marking a decade of the IA Awards, in addition to our, our usual bronze, silver and green accreditation awards, we're also awarding IA member organizations for going above and beyond in eight different categories. This category being Sustainable Transport Champion is one of them. Uh, the results are being announced in different webinars across the week and at the IIE Awards itself on Thursday, so there will be a, a recap of all the different winners for the other eight categories. Um, so we looked at, uh, for this particular uh, award, Sustainable Transport Champion, we looked at what sustainable transport actions were taken by a business or what investments or innovations they made and, and also how they measured this. So the winner, of IIE Sustainable Transport Champion for 2020 is LIDA, uh, Leeds Environmental Design Associates. So this is one of our, our smaller businesses, which is quite exciting because they are punching well above their weight in terms of sustainable transport initiatives that they have in place, particularly those relating to cycling. They've got excellent facilities and policies available to encourage cycling to work and for business travel, and with the addition of a uh, bike shed and an e-bike this year. They're also working to influence others by encouraging visitors to travel sustainably too. They share their facilities with other tenants and uh, their Twitter hashtag campaign, which is hashtag engineer by bike, shows evidence of how a director and an engineer can travel offsite um, to, to visit uh, by a public transport and bike. So getting, getting to Matt's point about, you know, showing that top management are, are bought in to that extent is really fantastic. Um, also noteworthy um, is the Northumbria Healthcare NHS Trust that, that have been uh, commended for their, their performance on, on sustainable transport as well. They were the winner for our best carbon reduction yesterday. Their transport activities have had a big role in their carbon reduction and judges said that they had a fantastic range of initiatives focusing on more than just business travel, a range of investments to encourage sustainable travel, particularly cycling and electric vehicles supplied with green energy too. It was also good to note that these initiatives were integrated in health and well-being promotions. So congratulations to LIDA, Leeds Environmental Design Associates for the win on Sustainable Transport Champion for 2020. So thank you so much, Matt, uh, for that really um, engaging and interesting talk on you know, what a business can do in their workplace, but also as advocates for sustainable transport in their local area. Uh, thank you to our category sponsor, Cross Keys Homes. Um, fantastic, you know, sustainable transport initiatives there as well. Our other IIE awards sponsors for 2020, BGL Group, Ecotricity, Davies Veterinary Specialists, Cool Food, Roy Thorns, Hunting Coombe Solicitors, and Green Energy Switch. Thank you all for your support and thank you everybody for attending this afternoon. <laughs>